Okay, in this video we're taking a brief look at um, some examples of both investor and issuer use of um, derivatives, to be honest. don't really like this section because I don't think it's really needed. It serves an excuse to talk about something called hedge accounting, which is definitely more of a um, financial sort of statements analysis topic. Uh, nevertheless, right, let's, uh, let's, let's just cover this as briefly as we can. Issuer um, use of derivatives. So, um, when they say issuer here, they mean derivative, sorry, derivatives. They really mean corporate use of derivatives. Um, how uh, companies, how non-financial, so corporations, not, not banks, not financial institutions, not funds, um, you know, how they use derivatives. So, some examples, and once again, these examples, they talk about these examples quite a bit, but, you know, it's not something that's exactly testable. Uh, they may reduce, uh, serve to reduce the volatility, um, for example, of commodity purchases that you need uh, in your production process or whatever. Uh, sorry, commodity purchases, not process, per purchases. Um, another example is to reduce the volatility of foreign exchange, you know, um, uh, of vol foreign volatility, if foreign exchange impact, apologies. Now, as I said, you know, beyond examples, or little examples, they talk about the accounting for derivatives, which mm, I don't think is th this is the place to, 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 to talk about it, but you have to know. So, by default, what happens is these um, derivatives um, are valued for financial statements purposes at fair value. So by default, derivatives are measured at fair value. And fair value is what you get by doing the daily mark-to-market -market process. You ascertain your gain or loss on the position, and it could be, you know, in the case of symmetrical linear derivatives, it's either positive or negative. And, you know, if the fair value of the, your position is positive, then it becomes an asset in the uh, balance sheet. If you are losing on your position, so it's negative, uh, then you uh, show it as a liability in your balance sheet. Don't worry, you won't have to do any computations. I just, I just need you to appreciate this. But because on a daily basis uh, the position gets marked to market, as you know, typically, um, at least with exchange trade derivatives, but with many OTC derivatives as well, especially if they go via a CCP, you're going to have some change to the valuation. So daily uh, change. Or the, or the change to the mark-to-market -market valuation will mean that either your asset becomes higher, lower, or your liability grows or becomes um, bigger, depending on whether we go more and more into positive territory, that's gains, or those gains are disappearing and maybe turning into losses. That's when we switch to the liability side of the balance sheet when uh, presenting the derivative position. However, all those changes, ups and downs, go to our P&L. They appear in the income statement. So if they're positive, of course, you're going to have gains. If they're negative, you're going to have losses. So the change um, goes to P&L. If one day your uh, derivative position is measured at plus 100 and next day it's plus 80 it's going to be that changed of tw change of 20 that goes to P&L but as a negative sign even though your derivative position is still valued at something positive there's been a negative change from one day to the next and the problem is for many uh, corporates is that holding derivatives as hedging instruments typically introduces um, a lot of volatility to their P&L and their balance sheet. And there are ways to um, prevent that from happening or at least stop it from happening, especially at the P&L level. It's called hedge accounting. Hedge accounting is a special sort of approach to um, accounting for derivatives. 
So by default, derivatives are measured at fair value, and the daily change goes to the change from the last measurement goes to P and L. However, hedge accounting provides an exception to that um, to that norm to that default um, to that to that default option, and what it will typically do is it will not stop you from measuring the daily mark to market of the derivative a position and sh displaying it either as an asset or a liability but it does change where you report does impact where you report the change it will not necessarily go to pnl so um, you need to be aware of three types of hedge accounting approaches the cash flow hedge the fair value hedge and the hedge of a net investment in a foreign entity so cash flow hedge first okay a cash flow hedge is all about absorbing um, the variability of cash flows or the variability of yes of cash flows typically associated with a floating rate asset or liability from a floating rate asset or liability. So think about this. Let's say you've got um, EG. Let's say you've issued a bond. Bond issued with a floating coupon, floating rate coupon. So you have to pay investors um, interest, a coupon that is based on the current level of some interest rate benchmark, the market rate, uh, market reference rate. And um, a perfect way to hedge this would be to use an interest rate swap where the, you know, this is the company, it's paying a floating coupon uh, to investors on the bonds that it issued, so it agrees with an IRS counterparty, interest rate swap, swap counterparty, that they will exchange floating payments based on the market rate in exchange for fixed. So a receive floating pay fixed interest rate swap from the perspective of the company will actually uh, mean that the two floating legs kind of offset one another and the company is just left paying something fixed. That's a perfect example, I think, of a cash flow hedge. And if you had an interest rate swap that was serving as a, as, as, as a hedging instrument for such a floating rate liability, it would qualify for, um, for uh, hedge accounting, and then the variability, the change in that, um, in that interest rate swap in its sort of valuation wouldn't necessarily impact your P&L in the same way as it would without hedge accounting. That's what you kind of have to know. Now, um, the second type of hedge accounting is something called fair value hedge or the fair value hedge and this is a bit different in the sense that um, it absorbs or just like you know before I wrote absorbs variability of cash flows from a floating rate asset or a liability in this case it's going to absorb um, or offset fluctuations in the fair value of um, of an asset or liability. So, typically, well, you can use this with many different things, but let's once again stick with debt. Let's say you're a company and you've issued bonds to investors but on these bonds you pay a fixed coupon, okay? A fixed coupon, e.g. Uh, 6%, because interest rates, at least when I'm now recording this video, are relatively high. And let's say a few months later, or even a few years later, interest rates go down, okay? And, you know, what does that cause? It causes the fair value of your liability to go up. The bonds that you issued still have a fixed coupon of 60%, even though interest rates have dropped. Obviously, those, that, that coupon doesn't adjust because it is fixed. And the investors who bought these bonds are very happy because the, the market value of their instrument goes up 
it's paying 6% at a time when interest rates are now much lower. But for you, the issuer, that is a drag which uh, increases the fair value of your, um, of your liability, or it's, it's sort of market value. And, I mean, how can you prevent that from happening? Or how, well, you can't prevent this from happening. You should have issued a floating rate liability. Now, th this is done already. But if you entered an interest rate swap where you've agreed that somebody pays you fixed rate in return for floating, then once again, this interest rate swap can be used as an offsetting mechanism because when interest rates drop, this leg of the swap will drop in value, the one that the company is suffering, but the fixed amount will flow nevertheless in an unchanged way. So, you know, its liability will grow in value, but the interest rate swap position will also grow in value as an asset because it's going to become positive and that will provide a natural sort of economic offset. This is called a fair value hedge and there is special accounting treatment for it and it doesn't have to be used you know, with debt uh, that's been issued. It, you can also use it for debt that you've acquired. You can use it with um, commodities when you've got inventory that is fluctuating in value, right? You can use it for commodity with commodity contracts, lots of different applications. And the final one your book wants you to know about, it, you literally don't have to know any more that I'm telling you what I'm telling you is already sufficient or even too much uh, compared to what's in the book, is the you know, the reason why I'm telling you a little bit more is I used to work with these types of instruments and the accounting treatment for them, so I could, have, I could tell you all day, basically, how these function, but you don't need to know it, is the net investment hedge. Now, this net investment hedge is sort of, it's a weird one because it really has very little to do with how you typically use derivatives. It's all about offsetting... So, you know, every one of these hedges either absorbs or offsets something, offsets or absorbs um, FX risk, so foreign exchange risk, associated with um, an equity investment in a foreign subsidiary. So basically, when you invest into foreign subsidiaries that you need to later on consolidate into your fo you know, financial statements, okay, your book doesn't say subsidiaries, it uses the term operations. Uh, okay, fine, operations is better. But when you invest in a foreign operation, um, you need to consolidate it into your own sort of consolidated financial statements. To, to show the picture for the whole group. And the thing is, even though that foreign operation may be doing fantastically well, its assets may be growing and liabilities may be shrinking, so equity there is, so net equity is, net assets or equity is, uh, is increasing, good. Um, all of that may be ruined when you translate from the foreign currency into your sort of group currency. Uh, and you may get a completely different picture because expressed in your domestic group currency, that picture may actually be de deteriorating, not due to operational reasons, but due to uh, pure currency fluctuations reasons. And, you know, this is what we talk about here, the net investment hedge protecting that uh, sort of variability of the... Or acting or going against trying to hedge that variability of the FX rate, but specifically associated with the translation of... Um, of a foreign operation into your own sort of home currency. Right, okay, so three examples of hedge accounting and now the implication. If you apply hedge accounting, and by the way, there is nothing compulsory about, about doing this, it's, um, it's something that a company may choose to do. Um, so, however, if it does, there is this benefit because instead of taking the gains and losses from the move, daily mark-to-market -market movement of the derivative to your P&L and hitting it either on the positive side or the negative, thereby causing or inducing volatility in your P&L, uh, the rule is that you recognized all the unrealized gains 
and losses. So until the derivative position uh, is still held and it hasn't uh, yet settled, it hasn't been settled, all those un unrealized gain and losses from the mark-to-market movements, mark-to-market movements, uh, are taken to equity, to a special place within equity, instead of impacting the PNL. Although, if you know a little bit more about this, uh, you will know that this is true for the cash flow hedge, though your book doesn't necessarily say this. This is true for the cash flow hedge. And um, the way it goes to equity, and here you have to know a little bit more about financial statements analysis, FSA, is it gets reported within something called OCI, but not PNL. That's instead of impacting PNL, other comprehensive income. And it is only later released to PNL, to true earnings, but once the position has sort of been finalized and once you know what its outcome is, all the interim valuations and changes to value on a day to day basis do not hit your PNL either positively or negatively. It's just the final outcome of how the derivative sort of um, finishes. And this is absolutely great for companies because uh, for financial reporters, so issuers of financial um, uh, for financial securities and those who prepare financial statements, because it gives you more sort of PNL predictability, at least in the interim sense. And um, another point is, and this is especially true uh, for the fair value hedge. Now, you know, I feel a little bit weird telling you this because this is a really complex topic and it's been thrown into derivatives for absolutely no good reason, I think. But, um, and it kind of requires you to know a little bit, don't try to make too much of this. What I'm telling you is sufficient and you don't have to sort of go more deeply to, to understand this because you won't get any other questions on this than what I'm covering here. It should even be simpler, just know the three types of um, hedge. So in a fair value hedge especially, the gains and losses on um, the derivative position are recognized in PNL in parallel to the gains and losses from um, the hedged position, the hedged item. So it's a case of uh, actually achieving m a match. If you are using a derivative which changes its valuation on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and therefore would impact your PNL all the time up or down but you're hedging something that hasn't yet even you know turned into a specific cash flow or whatever then you um, you will be you, you would have a mismatch and hedge accounting forces these two to work in parallel and impact PNL at the same time. And this is true for a very fair value hedge, but also for a cash flow hedge as well. Um, because when the all the accumulated gains and losses uh, under cash flow hedges are first accumulated in equity and then they get from equity released to PNL, it will be at the same time when that anticipated future transaction happens, for example, that we were trying to hedge or uh, when you do indeed have to f suffer the higher coupon on a floating rate bond. Okay, let's just mention that in order to qualify for hedge accounting, so in order to apply this special treatment to derivatives, look, let me go back for a moment. The default treatment for derivatives is whatever you do, interest rate, swap, futures contract, or something different, measure its fair value all the time, so mark to market, report it in the balance sheet as an asset liability, but keep updating the values and keep throwing the change, the delta, to your PL, thereby wreaking havoc in your PL. So you never know what the movements will be next day. 
hedge accounting gives you a, a mechanism to stop that from happening. You still have to keep track of the mark-to-market -market value of your position, but especially with the cash flow hedge, which is the most popular type of hedge for, uh, for companies, non-financial entities, that daily change in the mark to market or the market value daily weekly depending on how often you measure it doesn't go to pnl so your pnl is secured protected from that volatility it gets sent to equity via other comprehensive income and there it causes fluctuations to your equity value but at least your pnl is unaffected and therefore your for example ability to pay a dividend doesn't get impacted brilliant for investors uh, and you have better control over your net profit and whether you know you achieve certain profit targets, for example. Okay, so this is desirable for companies because it allows them to protect their PNL from these wild possible swings, because everything gets put into equity at least temporarily and released to PNL once the derivative. Act you know, position is actually typically over, so we know how much it we gained on it or lost. The interim fluctuations are rerouted somewhere else, but then taken to PNL once the thing is finished. Uh, so potentially, you would want to use hedge accounting. It's voluntary, but you know most companies think it's quite des de desirable. But in order to do this, you have to kind of qualify. There has to be a close match between the derivative you're using for hedging purposes and the transaction you're trying to protect, the underlying transaction. And this close match, uh, you know, is, um, is uh, evidenced by measuring things, you know, linear regressions, measuring correlations, all that kind of thing. Um, therefore, because a close match is required, it's often the case that uh, you will typically, or often, or let's say more likely to be achieved when using customized derivatives for hedging purposes, instead of, you know, the off-the-shelf futures contracts on an exchange which may not suit your risk exposure very well in terms of timing because futures contracts expire on certain specific days for example at the end of a quarter but you uh, you may be protecting a transaction an anticipated cash flow that may be happening not at the very end of a quarter but on a specific day mid-quarter you may still use futures contracts for a an approximated hedge, not a perfect one, but it may not necessarily qualify for hedge, ca hedge accounting if it's deemed not to be close enough. Okay, so when using customized OTC derivatives, that's when you are most likely to get that much derivatives. Although I'm not precluding futures, uh, you just have to run certain pre uh, and after post tests to see whether the match was indeed close in terms of the two things going in opposite direction of setting their movements. Now, that was a heavy one, wasn't it? Issuer uses of derivatives, focusing mainly on hedge accounting. There is also a block on investor uses of derivatives, but this one is just full of very simple examples. Uh, so let's just provide some, you know, typical uses here that your book mentions replication something we'll be dealing with in the next uh, videos when we go into replication and arbitrage replication of a desired position so you know like i told you instead of uh, buying 1000 barrels of oil because i think their price may go up i may use a derivative contract on a futures contract on oil as a replication of the exposure that I would feel. So I'll use derivatives rather than cash because hey, it's easier to transact. It's simpler. It doesn't require so much of a capital outlay up front and so on, right? I can apply leverage and so on. Now, another, another um, reason is isolation or another use of... Um, a specific uh, 
exposure. Right? Um, and I want to reduce this exposure, but maintain other risks. Right? Let me give you a brief example. So, like when you buy a bond, a corporate bond, there's lots of factors that may impact, or risk factors that may impact its value. For one, you've got the, so let's say, bond value, right? Especially a corporate bond. You're going to have impact from the uh, financial condition of the issuer, which manifests itself uh, in what we call the risk of default, default risk. But if the bond has a fixed coupon, as you will know from studies of fixed income, there's also the impact of interest rates changing in the markets. And if they uh, go down, the, the value of fixed bond goes up. If interest rates go up, the value of fixed bond goes down. Now, you've got the obviously, and there are other risk factors as well. Now, you can choose to either, when you buy the bond, keep that bundle of two risks, or two main risks, or actually uh, use derivatives to um, kind of switch off one of the risks but keep the other or partially switch one of the risks off and maintain maybe just 50 or 60% of it. Uh, the way you get rid of market interest rates exposure is by typically by using interest rate swaps and other interest rate derivatives. The way you try to um, offset uh, the risk of default is by using credit default swaps. And nobody says you have to enter positions that perfectly match the value of your bond holding because you can um, adjust the level of exposure by using derivatives to keep some of it, but not all of it. Uh, and you can uh, essentially, on a continuous continuous basis, refine these levels of uh, hedging that you uh, as as you wish, right? Okay, so that's an so that's an example of that. And of course, from an investor's perspective, the great thing about derivatives it it allows for an easier taking of short positions, taking short positions in a very flexible and sort of efficient way as compared to, to classic short selling. Now, the good thing is, I think, having talked about hedge accounting, is that investors are typically not really interested in hedge accounting. Okay, it's the sort of the corporate uh, users of derivatives that are. Um, the uh, you know if you if you're a fund, for example, uh, the 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 money invested um, in daily M to M, so mark to market, where you need to put in additional margin. Uh, so the margin invested in daily M to M, you know, that will impact your net asset value if if you're a if you're a fund, and uh, generally speaking, you will you will be okay with this with these fluctuations uh, impacting also your P and L. Um, instead of in being interested in in hedge accounting, which then leads typically to the adoption of customized derivatives to achieve that close match, we will typically, you know, as investors, we will favor, we will prefer to use exchange traded derivatives because they're nice liquid instruments, they're standardized, the costs associated with entering them are not huge in comparison to customized derivatives. Because for us, this this business of getting a close, ma close match doesn't matter so much uh, because we will not be applying hedge accounting anyway. And we don't care about protecting everything 100% um, finely and, and, and in a way that leaves absolutely no risk typically.